Today we're looking at the law of conservation of energy. We'll look at it mostly from a conceptual uh, viewpoint today and then the next lesson we'll get into the mathematics and using conservation of energy as a problem-solving strategy. You may remember this definition of energy from your middle school or earlier science classwork that energy is the ability to do work. This is a kind of a holdover from the days of steam engines when people first started thinking about energy. Um, the law of conservation of energy really arose from attempts to understand how steam engines worked and to make them more effective. So energy was really a measurement of how much work you could get out of your steam engine, how much water could you pump out of your mine, how many sewing machines could it run, things of that nature. But a better, more modern version is this idea that energy is a fundamental property of a system that is conserved. The old definition makes it harder to understand what work actually is. We'll get to what work is later in the lesson. So this is very vague, but it's also very flexible and um, a better concept than just this idea that it's the ability to move something. So here are the two forms of energy that you're probably familiar with from earlier classwork. Kinetic energy, that's energy due to motion. So whenever a system has any part of it that is moving, then that system has kinetic energy. This could be moving in a straight line, along a curve, or rotating. Potential energy you may have heard referred to as stored energy. And this is energy that's due to the location of the parts of the system and the action of a force. Your earlier class work may have left out this idea that there are always forces involved with potential energies. Some example of systems that have potential energy, stretched or compressed springs, the gravitational interaction between the Earth and objects near its surface creates potential energy, particularly when those objects are elevated, and of course magnets and electric charges create potential energies when they interact with each other. Now notice that in both of these kinds of energy we are talking about systems, we're not talking about objects. We can think about kinetic energy of an object that's moving, but we cannot think about potential energy as a property of an object, because potential energy involves a force, and when there's a force involved, that's an interaction between two bodies. So energy can really only be calculated and used as a property of a system. In this way, it's like momentum. Here are some other forms of energy, but if you think about these other forms, you'll see that they're actually all just kinetic and potential energies, but on a atomic or subatomic level. One of the great understandings of 19th century physics was this idea of thermodynamics, which told us that the atoms that make up a substance are not at rest. They are always at movement, and if they are moving, then they have kinetic energy. So thermal energy is really the kinetic and in solids and liquids some potential energy due to these motions that um, all atoms have above absolute zero. In chem class you probably talked about Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, reaction energies. These are just releases of potential energy that's caused by the electromagnetic binding forces that hold the atoms together to make molecules. Likewise, there are forces that bind together particles to make up nuclei, and those forces can also generate potential energies through their interactions. So when you look at it, there are really only two kinds of energy in the world, kinetic energy and potential energy. We're going to study these on a macroscopic level, and when we do that, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of a system is called its mechanical energy. As I mentioned earlier, energy became a part of physics in the late 18th, early 19th century when people realized that they could not get an arbitrary amount of work out of a steam engine. There were limiting principles 
that controlled how much work an engine can do. And they began to look for these principles and what they discovered was now known as the law of conservation of energy. If you have a closed system, the total energy of that system remains constant over time. There can be transformations from one type of energy to another without any loss or gain, but in a completely closed system, there is no gain. So here are some examples of transformations of energy. When an object falls, the gravitational potential energy transforms to kinetic energy. Of course, the opposite happens when an object rises. In chemical reactions, we have chemical energy transforming into thermal energy. That would be an exothermic reaction, and of course an endothermic reaction would be the opposite. An explosion. The chemical energy of the explosive is released and transformed into kinetic energy of the products and surroundings as well as some thermal energy. But in all of these scenarios, the total energy of the system is constant before and after. The loss of gravitational potential energy of a falling object is exactly equal to the gain in kinetic energy of that object. So this is expressed in this diagram, which your textbook calls the basic energy model. You can see we have a system boundary and we have transformations represented by the arrows inside. So we can have kinetic energy transforming into potential energy or vice versa. We can have chemical energy transforming into kinetic or potential. Uh, we can have all of those forms transforming back and forth with thermal energy. So the total energy of the system expressed as the sum of all the different kinds remains constant if the system is isolated from its environment. It's not always easy or practical to include every interaction inside the system boundary. Uh, for example, if I were to push an object, there would be chemical energy released in my muscle cells, and some of that would actually end up as the kinetic energy of the object. That calculation of the chemical energy loss and the subsequent thermal energy gain of me becomes an unnecessary complication to see what's happening to the system. So what we can do is we can put the system boundary between me and the object I'm trying to move around and we can deal with that energy that I'm inputting into the system as a transfer. So a transformation is energy that changes form inside the system boundary. A transfer is energy that moves in or out of a system. So with that idea, we can update the basic energy model, and you can see the purple arrows indicating transfers. So across the system boundary, I can input work or heat, and one thing that your text leaves out is waves. Right now, the speakers of your computer are transferring energy to you in the form of sound waves. They are actually increasing the kinetic energy of bones in your ears through that work. So work, heat, and waves are considered positive when they increase the total energy of the system, when energy flows in from the environment to the system, and negative when the energy flow direction is opposite. So when energy leaves the system, the total energy decreases, then that transfer is considered negative. The transfer that we're most concerned with this semester is work. Work is mechanical energy being transferred in or out of a system by the action of a force. So if I'm going to push a box across the floor, rather than deal with the chemical energy decrease and thermal energy increase of my muscles, I'm just going to talk about the work that I do. So I push a box across the floor, the force that I apply to that box increases its kinetic energy and some thermal energy increase if there's some friction involved. And so the, that amount of kinetic energy increase and thermal energy increase would be what I would call the work done by me. So this is a positive work because I am increasing the energy of the system. 
Here's another example. A baseball is coming to me. I catch it. It stops. That means its kinetic energy goes to zero. The total energy of that system decreases. I have done negative work on the system to decrease its total energy. This is consistent with what you studied in chemistry about heat transfers. When heat goes into a system, we call that positive. The total energy of that system is increased. When heat flows out of a system, we call that negative. The total energy of that system has decreased. The net flow of heat is always going to be directed from a high temperature to a low temperature region. So this is a demo that I like to do in live class, uh, but here we're just going to have to talk about it based on this photo. So this is a large box which is being dragged across the rough floor. And what you're seeing is an infrared photograph of that. So whoever is dragging the box is transferring work to the system of the box and the floor. They're doing positive work and trying to increase the total energy of the system. That work is transformed into two things inside the system. Kinetic energy of the box and thermal energy of the box and the floor. Thermal energy in systems is measured by its temperature. So if you increase E-thermal, you increase the temperature of that part of the system. Once that part of the system is warmer, however, it will tend to irradiate, or radiate away that energy in the form of waves. The, this energy radiation is in the form of infrared light, which your eyes are not capable of seeing, but this special camera can actually detect those waves radiating away from the warmed region of the floor. And so you can see that trail left behind by the box of warmer floor. So that is a transfer out. The total energy of the system is decreasing. So here's our basic energy model written out as an equation. The change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy plus the change in thermal energy plus the change in chemical energy is all going to equal the work done on the system. If the system is completely isolated, then that work term on the right hand side would equal zero. In the next video, next week, we will learn how to put uh, quantities and expressions to each of those terms, the kinetic energy, the potential energy, the thermal energy, and the work and then we'll be able to use this basic energy model and the law of conservation of energy as a problem-solving equation. But that's coming up in our next lesson.